Hello and welcome to Inside the Women of Denver. I'm your host, Crystal Covington, founder of Women of Denver. Every now and then, we'll be bringing you inspiring stories of women all over the world who are pushing themselves to achieve great heights, making an impact in their community, and of course, commanding their worth and building a strong financial empire. Today's story comes from Tanisha A. Sykes, founder of the TAS Media Group in New Jersey. I met Tanisha when she was senior editor of Personal Finance and Careers for Essence, a magazine I grew up reading as a young girl and still subscribe to. Tanisha has 20 years of experience as a journalist and because of her specialty as a expert career, giving expert career advice, she's got tons of insights to share on how you can excel in your life and career to change your mind and your money. Tanisha, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Crystal. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So first off, I want to know about your new business. Tell us about your media group, the inspiration behind it, and how you got the courage to leave behind your career as a magazine editor. So the TAS Media Group is really a media group that takes all of my years of experience as a journalist, as a writer, as an editor, and really helps clients to figure out, you know, what is your messaging? How do you figure out the kind of storytelling that you want to tell? And then what audience are you choosing to do that? And so I not only help clients do that, but I also write and edit for a number of different publications, including Money Magazine, Time Magazine, and the USA Today. In fact, I'm working on a series right now for the USA Today for young millennials. It's called the Young Investor Series, and I can't wait for it to come out in the next few weeks. And so you asked me what the inspiration was behind my company. What it is, is I really feel like I'm a, a preacher, a reacher, and a teacher. Way back in Philadelphia when I was growing up, I always thought I would either be one of two things. Either I was going to be a teacher because I wanted to teach people and I thought I was really great at stringing along a sentence. But that's also the same reason why I wanted to be a journalist, because I think at heart I'm a storyteller. But I'm a storyteller who educates. That's why a lot of the articles that I've written and edited over the years are always how-to articles, are always service articles, are always articles that are tippy, if you will, and giving lots and lots of information. Mm -hmm. And so that's really how I started the company. I said, how can I take what I've done in my life as a journalist, as a writer and an editor, and really parlay that into a business? And the reason why I did it, I told you this earlier, it was more by you know force than by choice in that I was laid off in October of 2014, like many Americans, and um, it was really okay. It was time for me to go. It was time to move on. I wanted to do something different with my life, and, and so you feel like God has called you to challenge you to do something bigger, to be greater, and to, to allow people to hear something that you have to say in a bigger way, and I thought starting this company would help me to do, to do that. Yeah. So you decided to live in a bigger way after, you know, something that some people would feel would make them feel small. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think it's anything wrong. It, it doesn't change who you are because you got like laid off. It doesn't change the skill set that you bring to the table. What it does is it shifts, I think, your perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying, you know, I didn't have moments, but for the most part, I was like, you know, to my former employer, are you sure? Is this what you're really trying to do? Because I thought to myself, and, and, and I can say it, I'm never going back. I've heard people, you know, entrepreneurs who say I'm unemployable. I won't say that because I still have clients that employ me, and that's fine. But what I know for sure is that I don't ever see me going back to a full-time situation doing a nine-to-five. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. If this is what you're doing out there, do your thing. Do it well. But if you're wanting to do something different in terms of being an entrepreneur, then you have to figure out the exit strategy. And I will say, Crystal, that was the one thing that I wouldn't do. I wouldn't sit down and focus on what does the TAS media group look like? Who do I want to, you know, what stories do I want to tell? And, and what are all of the foundational things that we need to do as business owners? So that's really where I am, really making sure that I set a solid foundation underneath this business so that I can tell those stories and continue to do that. I don't really think that I've, I've left my magazine editing behind because I really feel like, honestly, it not only informs every choice that I make, but it also informs the stories I tell. How I tell those stories, and then as we say in the magazine business, how we package those stories. What are the multiple entry points? 
And I think that's important because everybody thinks differently, they read differently, and they feel differently when they look at, at a magazine article. Some people want the long story, some people want the tidbits. Other people just want to say, you know, hey, what are the five ways that you're going to help me? And you can do that through the form of a sidebar. And so there are a lot of different ways to reach people. And I know that, you know, two things for sure. I know how to read an audience, no matter what that audience is. So I know how to talk to, in as much as I can talk to senior citizens about social security and what they need to be thinking about, I can talk to young millennials about what steps they need to be thinking about in terms of investing and what does that look like. Or I can talk to African American women about what they're thinking about to make sure they own their voice at the table when they, when they have a seat at a board table. And so those are very specific audiences who are looking for different things, but I've learned the power of listening. As a, as a writer and a journalist. And I really think that's part of what my business is, really helping to tell stories and helping clients to figure out what they want to tell as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure getting to this point over the course yeah. of all these years required a lot of life lessons. So can yeah. you tell us a little bit about some of the lessons that have led you here and you know the career progression that you went through so i know you didn't get just to you, you know you didn't start as an editor you didn't start there so how did you get up to that point um i mean where you had a really high level career yeah and so how i got to that point is i, I sort of worked my way up through the ranks so to say i started out as a fact checker as a copy editor and a proofreader in different magazines such as Black Enterprise Magazine. I worked for the Philadelphia Tribune. I'm from Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, born and raised, just like Will. Uh, and I worked at, a, I think, a company called the Philadelphia Sun, as a matter of fact. So I started there. I, I went to college, obviously, and uh, went to Rutgers University and worked on the school newspapers, worked for the Black Voice Carter Bariqua, as well as the Daily Targum, which is the more mainstream newspaper, because I wanted to tell both sides of the story. And, and then from there, worked at local and regional newspapers. Read a lot and figured out that, you know, I had to have a lot more experience as a writer. And then went into working at Black Enterprise. And I worked there nearly nine years, I believe, and worked my way up. That was sort of the training round for me as a journalist because I started as a copy editor and a researcher and then I was able to become uh, the consumer affairs editor and eventually became a features editor. And from there, I went over to Essence and became a senior editor of personal finance and careers. And, and what I will say is at each junction, I learned about myself that, you know, not only can you do it, but that you're good at it. And so the one thing, one of the lessons that I learned is to be consistent in what I bring to the table. Yeah. The other thing that I learned is that you have to own your voice. I think as any person in the workplace, if you have something to say, actually say it. It's not enough to go around telling your colleagues. It's not enough to sort of write it down in our journals. You have to bring it to the table because yeah. then people can know, you know, not only do you have an opinion, but you can contribute in a bigger way to this team. And I think sometimes, particularly as women, you know, I know I was scared back in the day. People don't think this, but I was very, very shy. I'm a former shy girl. Nobody believes it, right? And so going back to understanding what your gifts were, I felt that one of my gifts was just being able to use my voice and have an opinion. And for sure, at Black Enterprise, I said, I raised my hand and said, not only can I do it, but I have an opinion on how to do it better. Yeah. And how we can do it smarter. How can we can be more strategic for purposes of the audiences that we serve? And I did that with every single job and in every single company. Wow. So um, as you know, Women of Denver, a lot of our mission is, you know, helping women be able to make that career progression and also knowing how to know their value and how to be able to ask for it, demand to be paid their worth. Um, so I want to know how your yeah. journey has been when it comes to, you know, pricing yourself, asking for the pay rate that you deserve, you know, how do you find out what your, what the value of your work is worth and how do you plan on continuing to reassess that as you continue in your career? And, and so this, here's a Tanisha's tip for everyone. If you don't ask the ask, you don't get the get. I've always said that over the years. I believe it. I know you're laughing like, girl, but I believe it in all of my heart. You better ask for what you think you're worth and, and, and don't go in there. And, and, you know, some people do this, some people don't, but don't ever walk into any situation with, I deserve. 
Because mm-hmm. we all deserve at the end of the day, right? Everyone, many of us, right? Period, people, period. We're all hard workers. But what you want to say is, here's how I've increased the bottom line. Here's how I've shaved off expenses. Here's how I have added value to the company. I worked on XYZ project and, and here were the great and positive results and really how it helped the company. Bosses, managers, supervisors do not care about how hard you worked. They mm-hmm. want to know how you've helped this company to move along and progress. That's what they want to hear. So what you want to do is twist it. You want to go from I to we. Yes. And so when you are having those conversations, you can begin to say, hey, you know, this is what we've been able to accomplish together. And here's how it's helped our company to flourish. You know, and, and then you say, and this is what I think it's worth in terms of the competitive market. And how do you figure out the numbers? How do you get the information? I wrote a, a piece for the USA Today not too long ago that talked about how do you, you know, figure out salary negotiations? You have to do your homework. If you're in a specific injury industry, I remember uh, one of the experts saying, if you're an engineer, for example, you want to go to the National Industry Association because they may have some type of salary guide or a poll or a review or a study that tells you, hey, here's currently what some of your other colleagues are, are making. You want to have conversations with your colleagues and your peers, maybe some who are in the company, but perhaps people who are outside the company, but still in the industry on that same sort of line or trajectory as your career and say, hey, I'm trying to get a sense of the range. This is what I'm looking to do next. It's my understanding that it's this. Does that fit with what you are thinking, hearing, and or experiencing? You don't ever have to ask the person, you know, hey, what do you make? Right. I don't really think, you know, and nobody wants to talk about that, but it's nothing wrong with it. If it's going to help somebody else along, then tell them. But if you don't want to tell your personal business, don't tell them your personal business. Give people a range of, of 20, maybe $20,000 range. But also maybe it's having a conversation with executive recruiters or recruiters who are not directly, you know, trying to find you that next position. We all have LinkedIn. Use it. Leverage it. Ask these questions. And then, of course, go online. Of course, you have monster.com and salary.com and you have salary wizard and you can either buy reports or you can find out information about where you are right now. So what you want to do is figure out, hey, how can I figure out what I should be making now? And then you compile a report. And not only do you take the numbers, but you keep an I've done well file. Now, what does that look like? That looks like, you know, hey, Here are all the great emails. Here are the accolades. Here's what the CEO said in passing. I wrote it down on this date at this time. That's what you want to take back to your supervisor because then when it's time, you can say, you know what? Here you are. I've created this for you. And here are some of the great things that I've been able to do over the years. Yes, I love that idea. I've done it. I call it my praise folder. Yes, absolutely. And it's nothing wrong with that because people assume that the boss knows what I've been doing. Yeah. The boss knows how hard I've been working. They may see you working hard, but they don't know every single solitary thing because they're running a whole team and or division and or a company, depending on how large or small the company is. So you can't assume that. You have to tell your own message and you have to tell your own story. Yeah. And you got to comfortable in it and what's the worst that they're going to say most times the worst is you know no right I'm not going to give you a raise right now and then you need to ask okay well why and what can I do to get what I'm looking for whether it's a raise or a promotion or a salary change or a change to a new division whatever it is ask the questions don't just take people at face value yeah good advice Um, Thank you. I love the fact that you kind of brought in the fact that, you know, you need to keep your own praise folder, your boss. You can't just expect your boss to be remembering every single thing you did. They're a human being. They're going to forget your accomplishments. They're kind of thinking in terms of, you know, what have you done lately? I know what you've done in the past couple weeks, perhaps, but they can't always recall what you did five months ago before you start getting to review periods where you get the chance to really, you know, ask again for that raise. And that's a good point. Don't wait till the review period. 
Mm -hmm. If you wait for a review period, you wait it too late. Don't wait until, you know, it, it's the review and you're going to walk in and, and then just, you know, sort of land blast them with it. They should already know what you've been thinking and you should know what they've been thinking because you really do want to be on the same page. If you want to get something, then what would be the point of sort of, sort of, you know, letting it be something where you wait till the last minute and you give all of this information. Then the boss is going to be like, well, I had no idea you were thinking all of this. No, you do that at the top of the period. Now, everybody doesn't go from January to December. So the top of the period could be right around round for, for some companies. Other companies, it could be in a couple of months, a new year will begin. So you have to know your company and also know your boss. Maybe you do a, a 15 minute chat just to go over career goals. This is where I am. This is what I've been able to do. And this is what I'd like to do more of. And, and if I were to accomplish those things, here's the result that I'm expecting. What are you thinking about that? Or what do you think about that? Then you know there are no surprises. Beautiful. So now, as you move into the next phases of your career, how are you focusing your energy, Tanisha, to you know, reach the level of success that you have in your mind? Sure. So one thing that I want to do is I really want to get more social, quite frankly. Uh, people are going to see Tanisha's tips on Instagram pretty soon. I do have my page all set up, but I'm going to be going live a lot more often to sort of not only give, you know, Tanisha's tips, but it'll be a lot of, you know, media tips. And, and how do you figure out what your audience looks like and how do you engage in people and how do you grow those numbers? And then taking all of that information and saying, OK, boom. Here's how you lever leverage it and create a, a sort of business where you can make money off of it. A lot of people, you know, either, you know, there are some people who are making money, of course, off of social, and there's all the rest of us who are like, I don't know how that person is doing that, you know, how because you got 30,000 followers, now you make it, you know, $30,000 every time you tweet. How does that work? So I'm really interested in that. This idea of multiple streams of income. I've always talked about it. I want to figure it out. And I like social, I like messaging, and I like audience. So I'm going to take all the sort of the whole of all of that, and I'm going to bring Tanisha's tips uh, to life in a way where I'm going to teach, particularly entrepreneurs, how to create small, uh, multiple streams of income using their social media feeds. All right. I'll be following you. <laughs> Thanks, girl. I appreciate it. I'm going to need it. And I'll be like, hey, Crystal, follow Crystal, y'all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you did kind of bring it up, but since you were a journalist for all these years, what is one really great tip that people can use if they want to start getting opportunities to get featured? What's a one quick step that they can do themselves to start landing those opportunities? So, okay. So let's say an editor, there's one quick step, and I'm dealing with this right now. I'm looking for um, quite a few different people for a series that I'm working on. Answer the question that's being asked. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? If an editor or a writer or a booker or a producer sort of puts out a pitch and says, you know, hey, I'm looking for folks, you know, tell me your top three ways to save money now. Don't tell me about your life, your bio, your kids, your mom, your dad. All of that is nice, but that doesn't answer the question because that is the quickest way to get skipped over. Yes. Answer what's being asked. Of course, give your information. Listen, you can attach that at the bottom. You can attach that as an attachment. You can just give a link. Listen, people are not dumb. They're going to get that information. They're going to make sure that you're credible. But we don't need, you know, from top of the page to the bottom of the page, the 39 reasons why we should choose you. What we need is three ways to save money and how you think you're the best person, you know, for that job. You're going to give the very best information. You, you have to be able to do that. That would probably be my one thing. Of course, I have others. I, I, but just really quick, I would also say, you know, know how to tell your story. Yeah. Tell your story like anybody else. So you have to be able to articulate it in a way where the, the editor, for example, says, oh my goodness, I need more of that. So know how to tell your story. Understand the audience that you're telling the story to. Sometimes you have to tweak 
things. And mm -hmm. that's okay. And, and then also just be succinct. Be in, out, and done. But give enough so that you're sort of wetting the whistle of the person who's reading it. Beautiful advice. Thank yeah. You. So the one question that I do have is you talked about responses, but where do they find the stuff to respond to? Where are these things put out there? Yeah. No. Okay. So if you're following a journalist, obviously on any of their social feeds, I don't do a lot of that. And I'll tell you why, because my audience doesn't respond to it. Okay. I asked my, you know, 3,300 followers, you know, hey, I'm looking for a certain type of subject or, you know, hey, do you know anybody who just lost their job, for example? And I get crickets. But I'll tell you where I get, I do. They've taught me, you also have to listen to your audience. You know, that's not what they're there for. They're like, I want a Tunisian tip. Don't be asking me, you know, <laughs> tell me, tell my life story on your Twitter. You know, people don't want to do that. I get that. But I use um, two particular places, helpareporterout.com. Uh -huh. has been very good to me as a journalist. Um, I will do pitches and queries, and I've gotten as many as 104 responses on one query, which is quite a lot. It floods my box. Uh, Google tells me you're going to run out of space. You keep this up. But, um, but, but I get a lot of feedback from there, and also profnet.org, I believe it is. So it's a profnet query. Yeah, and that's a citizen company. For those yeah. Who can look it up. yeah, absolutely. And so if you're on there and you're sort of looking through those feeds, see what fits in terms of what it is that you're offering, whether it's, it's your brand, it's a product, it's your organization or an association, or even your, your thought matters as an expert. If you're a subject matter expert, then put it out there. And you never know, like I said, answer that question and make sure that you can serve the audience that you're speaking to. Otherwise, it really goes to your authenticity as an expert yeah. and as perhaps, you know, a small business owner, which is a lot of the people um, that I'm looking for. But I would use those two sources. Those are very good and they're credible. Okay. Good advice. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So finally, I want to know what you're looking forward to in your personal life. What's inspiring you right now? So what's inspiring me is, and, and I'll tell you, I've been a hard worker all of my life, right? And I'll continue to work hard, but I think as my business blossoms and it takes off and I earn more, I think that I'm looking forward to doing more experiences, more experiences with my family. I've been married, uh, been with Doug uh, 27 years. Uh, we've been married for 17 and we have two children, Isaiah and Kendall. And so what I'd like to do is for us to go out and experience the world. I'd love to do more travel because we've all been working hard in this family <laughs> over the years. So I'd love to be able to enjoy some more of the fruits of that labor. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tanisha, for all that amazing advice. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Crystal. And thank you for listening to Inside the Women of Denver. Always remember that you deserve to be seen, heard, and known. I'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening to Inside the Women of Denver. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to click subscribe and don't forget to leave a rating so we can reach even more listeners. And if you're in the Denver area or visit often, you can join our community free. Just visit thewomenofdenver.com and click join WOD.